Amen. Turn in your Bibles with me, if you will, to John chapter 14. We've been teaching on uh, the Holy Spirit, and we want to go a little bit further with that tonight. Jesus, on the last night that he was with his disciples at the Last Supper, gave interesting and tremendous information to us about the Holy Spirit and what to expect, what his disciples could expect after he was taken captive by the, the Jews, handed over to the Romans, and then crucified. John chapter 14, verse 16, Jesus said, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. We see from the Scripture that there are two distinct works of the Holy Ghost. One work is within us, and the other work is upon us. Now, we want to talk about uh, the spirit within a little bit tonight. We see in John chapter 20, after Jesus' crucifixion, when he appears to the disciples, we see the work of the Holy Spirit, the first work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. We'll start in verse 19 of John chapter 20. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. Now we know that something happened to these guys. The last couple of verses of the uh, Gospel of Luke tell us that after Jesus appeared to them and breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Ghost. It said they were openly in the temple worshiping and praising God. Well, what changed them from being behind closed doors for fear of the Jews to being openly in the temple? It had to be some kind of change on the inside. Well, the Bible says they worshiped the Lord and they were filled with joy. And joy is one of the nine fruit of the Spirit. It's the same thing that happened in Acts chapter 8. When Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them, the people gave heed to what he said, both hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. And there was great joy in the city. When they believed Philip the evangelist preaching about Jesus and showing them the power of God, showing them the reality of God, there was, the city was filled with great joy as a result of all the people that gave their hearts to, to the Lord. So if the disciples are doing the same thing, then we have to conclude that they had the same experience. That this is the point where the church began in John chapter 20. A lot of people, uh, most theologians in fact, say that the church began in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Ghost was poured out. But this is prior to the, the day of Pentecost. These things that are happening in John chapter 20 are happening on the day that Jesus was raised from the dead. And so there's some 40 odd, 45, 46 days left before Acts chapter 2 comes around. We also have another clue here in John chapter 20, verses 22 and 23. When he said, when it breathed on them and said unto them, Receive the Holy Ghost. Notice he talks about the connection of sins, the remission of sins, and the Holy Spirit. Now, folks, if Jesus breathed on them and said, receive you the Holy Ghost, put yourself in their position. What would you expect is, to, is taking place? If Jesus appeared and breathed on you and said anything, wouldn't you expect to get it? Wouldn't you expect to receive something from him? Jesus didn't jerk these guys around. Jesus wasn't hiding himself from them. He wasn't trying to keep them in the dark about anything. When he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost, they received the Holy Ghost. What happened? Well, since he's talking about the Holy Ghost in connection with the remission of sins, we have to understand, therefore, that the, this is the point where the disciples got saved. Thomas wasn't with them. It tells us about Thomas uh, in the next few verses. But outside of Thomas, this is where these guys are receiving salvation. Now, there are some things that uh, the Lord's been dealing with me about off and on for the last couple of years. And it has to do with righteousness. Folks, I don't think the church understands righteousness in the way that we're supposed to. Look with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 
this salvation experience that's described in John chapter 20 for the disciples and we see in operation during the book of Acts, this is the same new birth experience that you and I receive. This is the same work of the Holy Ghost in us. Notice in verse 21, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, For he, speaking of God, has made him, speaking of Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now notice those words made. Jesus was made to be sin so that we could be made to be righteous. Now the idea that it seems that most of the church has, and I, I'll have to confess, even though I knew better, this was the idea I had for a long time. And that is the righteousness of God that we're supposed to be made is something that very few Christians ever take a hold of and recognize for its great importance. Rather, it seems that most Christians, and like I said, I was guilty of this for a while too, it seems that most Christians just have the idea that righteousness was something that was imputed to man or laid on him like a coat would be put on your shoulders or something like that. But it's not the real nature of mankind. It's not the real nature of those that give their hearts to the Lord. But folks, the Bible says that, Je that Jesus was made to be sin. God made Jesus to be sin for us in the same way that God made us to be righteous. Now, if God is calling us righteous in his word, if the Holy Ghost is leading us to understand that we're righteous according to the word, but instead God is sitting back in heaven with a wink and a smile saying, well, you know, we'll call it righteous, righteousness, but you know these people, they're not really righteous. And I think that's a lot of the idea, and certainly that's a, a, a silly exaggeration of the way it works. But I think that it's very similar. It may not be too much of an exagger exaggeration in a lot of people's eyes or in a lot of people's experience. But God intends for us to understand that there was a change of nature. We're right there in verse 21, back up to verse 17 in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice verse 17. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The word creature is the word creation. One translation, my favorite verse, my fa favorite translation of this verse says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new species of being. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. If any man be in Christ... He's a new creature. He's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Now, the old things that uh, have passed away is, according to the Old Testament, the stony heart, the heart that was spiritually dead, the heart that was not alive unto God. Those things were taken out. And instead, God put a new spirit in us, not the same spirit that we had just refurbished, but a new spirit if the Bible is to be believed. He places a new spirit in us, and then he puts his spirit, the Holy Spirit, inside our new spirit, our new recreated human spirit. Now, how does that work? I don't know. I know it's an instantaneous thing. I know that as soon as someone acts on what the Bible says about believing in their heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confessing him as their Lord, I know that it happens instantly. I know it's the greatest display of God's power that you and I will probably ever witness because what could be more supernatural, what could be more magnificent than God instantly making us a new spirit and then placing the Holy Spirit on the inside of, of that. God wants us to understand that we've really been made the righteousness of God. I think one reason that we fail to, to uh, take hold of that like we should is because we don't understand what Jesus had to do to purchase that, that salvation, that righteousness for us. There are a lot of things that the Bible indicates to us about the work that Jesus did. I want to refer you, first of all, to uh, Romans chapter 1. I'll start in verse 1 and read down through about verse 5. It says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, 
concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of, a of David according to the flesh. And declared to be the son of God with power. Now you know as well as I do that Jesus didn't magnify the fact that he was the son of God when he was in his earthly ministry. We've told you before that there are 65 times where Jesus refers to himself as either the son of God or the son of man. 60 of those times he identifies himself as the son of man. Only five of the 65 does he identify himself as the son of God. And three of those are in the same setting. Jesus did not talk about himself being the son of God he talked about himself being the son of man he was here on the earth to identify with man not identify with God he was here on the earth to identify with man and show God's will show God's goodness show God's mercy through the works of healing and the other miracle works and the preaching and teaching that he did here it says however that Jesus was declared to be the son of God by the resurrection power that raised him up. The resurrection power that raised him up. Now in Romans chapter 4, the last verse of the chapter, is verse 25. The preceding verses tell us about Abraham's faith, about how that he believed God and, and received the promise, the child of promise, Isaac, way past when he and Sarah were of childbearing age. And as a result of his faith, of his willingness to believe God, he not only received the promise that God made to him about that child, and he made that promise some 25 years before, but he also gained righteousness, or as the scripture says, righteousness was imputed to him. Now the word imputed just simply means counted to your favor. It's an accounting term. It means putting something on the, the debit side rather than the credit side. It's talking about how that it was measured to Abraham. But you know as well as I do that nobody in the Old Covenant could be righteous because Jesus had not yet been to the cross. And that will bring us down to verse 25 of Romans chapter 4, talking about Jesus. It says, Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Now this verse of Scripture is... is um, is missing something. Not that it isn't true, not that it isn't an accurate translation, but the word that's used to describe this work that Jesus did is a word that means time. It's a word that refers to time. The description is talking about when Jesus was raised. This verse of Scripture is telling us, Paul's trying to communicate to us by the Holy Ghost, when Jesus was raised from the dead. Now with that in mind, let's read it again. It says, who, Jesus, was delivered for our offenses and was raised again instead of for, it should be when we were justified. When we were justified. Now, here's why that's important, folks. At least it seems important to me. You decide for yourself, I guess. But one of the reasons that this seems so important to me is because it deals with the legal side of righteousness. It deals with the legal side of righteousness. Now, righteousness is all in or nothing. You either are righteous or you're not righteous. There's no measure of righteousness. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that righteousness can grow. When it comes to righteousness, you're either in or out. And that makes sense when we understand that the righteousness that is made available for us is the righteousness of God himself, not of works. Because if works had anything to do with righteousness then you and I and everybody else every other Christian on the earth would be on, on a, a, a moving scale a sliding scale of how righteous we were you might be more righteous than me in certain areas through your behavior and your works I might be more righteous than you in other areas and that's the way it would be for everybody but God set this plan of righteousness this this work of redemption in motion so that it was an all or nothing thing see if we were at different levels of righteousness there would have to be a point where we could reach a certain stage of righteousness that would provide us greater benefits than somebody that never uh, took the righteousness that they had on the small measure of the small scale and ever did anything with it 
Well, God couldn't have that because that would mean there would be different things or different works or different aspects of your prayer life and mine. My prayer life might be more effective than yours in certain respects, and yours might be more effective than mine in other respects. Now, Paul makes a big deal by the Holy Ghost. He makes a big deal in talking about the law of Moses and about how the law of Moses was fulfilled by the work of Jesus. Thank God it was. Because all they understood was obedience. All they understood was do good or else. That's what the Old Testament was all about. Well, when Jesus came to the earth, when Jesus fulfilled the plan of redemption by going to the cross and when he was raised again from the dead, the Bible tells us that there had to be a specific moment in time when the price for sin and death was paid. There had to be a certain moment of time, a literal moment in time where the price for righteousness was paid. And that's what verse 25 of Romans 4 is trying to get across to us. When the price was paid, immediately the life of God came back upon him. The Holy Spirit came back upon him and raised him from the dead. He didn't spend one more moment in the lower parts of the earth than was absolutely necessary to obtain the righteousness that God intended for us to have. Now look with me over to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 1, read down through the next three or four verses. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must, which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto the servant, his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy. And keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Notice verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Now notice that phrase, Jesus was the first begotten from the dead. What dead? Folks, I know this cuts crossways with a lot of people's doctrine. And I know a lot of people just prefer not to think about it. But I think, I know for in my own case, I miss out on a lot of God's love for us. I miss out a lot on the understanding of of who I am in Christ when I don't think or didn't think these things through and understood according to the scripture that Jesus was the firstborn from the spiritually dead. See, most of the church looks at Jesus' death as being the death on the cross. Well, if the death on the cross was all that there was, if that was necessary, where was Jesus for the three days after his crucifixion? See, the fact that he was not seen or known among his disciples for those three days is an indication to me that during those three days and nights in the lower part of the earth, he was paying the price for man's, the sins of mankind. If Jesus dying physically was all there was to it, everybody saw and witnessed what happened to him physically on the cross. And if Jesus is just going through the agony, and I, I don't mean to make light of it or diminish it in any way whatsoever, because there was an awful beating that he took in Pilate's court. And the shedding of his blood in Pilate's court is what the Bible says, obtain healing for our physical bodies. By his stripes we were healed. But Jesus died quicker on the cross than the two thieves on his right and his left. And if this is just a matter of holding out until the time came where his life expired from his physical body, then why is he sweating great drops of blood in, garden, in the Garden of Gethsemane? What is so appalling about that? And again, I'm not saying that it wasn't severe. It wasn't something that we would have all cold, recoiled from. Probably would have been enough to keep most of us from going through with God's plan. I'm glad he was stronger than we might have been. 
But if that was all it was, folks, why wouldn't Jesus commend his spirit into the hands of God? Everybody see and witness, which they did, the ones that were around the cross. They witnessed the thunder in heaven. They witnessed the earthquake and the rocks breaking. They witnessed the darkness that came upon the earth during the time Jesus was on the cross. They saw these things, and even the Roman soldiers said, surely this was the Son of God. Surely this is who the people said that he was or said that he claimed to be. Well, once it took a few minutes for, perhaps for that to sink into everybody, then the life of God just could have come back on Jesus and he could have pulled his hands off the cross. The angels could have helped him and he could have risen from the dead for everybody around the cross to see. Why the three days and nights? Why the time between his crucifixion and his resurrection? Folks, I believe the things that were the most repulsive to Jesus, the things that were causing him to draw back, I think those things were the unseen things that happened in the spirit realm, that happened in the lower part of hell, that brought our justification. Look with me to Psalm 88. Psalm 88 covers some of the things that the Bible indicates to us that Jesus endured to purchase redemption and righteousness for us. Verse 1, a song or psalm for the sons of Korah to the chief musician upon something. You finish reading the rest of that yourself. I have no idea how to pronounce any of that stuff. But notice that it's a song for the sons of Korah. Korah is first mentioned in the, the early forming of the people of Israel when they come out of the land of Egypt, when God delivered them out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Korah and his sons were known as musicians, psalmists. There are a lot of songs that the sons of Korah wrote that are in our book of psalms in the Bible. This is not something that happened in, in some obscure point in time. This is something that took place prophetically by the hand of God, by the revelation of the Holy Ghost. And nobody knew, knew, or knew then or knows now when it's supposed to be for. This is one of those things that the Holy Ghost gave that was a mystery to the ones to whom it was given. But not so much a mystery to us. O oh Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night before thee. Let my prayer come before thee and incline thine ear unto my cry. For my soul is full of troubles and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. Now folks, if you just stop there and up to this point, the psalm could be talking about anybody in any difficult or troubling situation. But it goes into some specifics from now to the end of the chapter, the end of the psalm that could only fit somebody that did what Jesus did for us. Verse 4, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. The word counted is a, it's kind of a difficult word because in one sense it means a plot or a scheme. Now if this is talking about Jesus, then this is revealing to us that this was the plan of God for him. He was counted with them that go down into the pit. Well, those that go down into the pit, if it's talking about death, who is it speaking of? Well, the righteous dead didn't go down into the pit when they died. They went to a place called paradise. that was referred to as paradise, a place that was called or named Abraham's bosom. You remember the story of the, the rich man and Lazarus, where both of them died. Lazarus was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man was ushered into hell. And the Bible tells us Jesus telling the story. And it's not a parable. He said a certain rich man and a certain man named Lazarus. Well, if he says certain, that means it has to be somebody and this means it's a real story. So the rich man in hell lift up his eyes and looked across the, the great gulf that was fixed between paradise and hell. It couldn't have been heaven. It couldn't have been associated with heaven. Paradise I'm talking about. It couldn't have been associated with heaven. So apparently paradise was the holding place for the righteous dead of the old covenant. 
And he said some things, and he called upon Abraham to have Lazarus come attend to him and dip his finger in water and cool his tongue, for he was tormented in the flame. And, of course, Abraham identifies and tells him nobody can go between the two places. Nobody can go from hell to paradise. Nobody can go from paradise to hell. Well, when it talks about those that go down to the pit, it's talking about the, the unrighteous dead, not the righteous dead. Notice it says, I am as a man that hath no strength. Now, you remember when Jesus was on the cross and he interacted with the, the two thieves, the one on the, uh, his left hand and the other on his right. One of them believed in, in him and the other didn't. The other was looking for Jesus and apparently he said it in a mocking way, not believing who Jesus was. He says, why don't you do something and get us down from here? And Jesus identified the power that he still had hanging on the cross to that point. He said, don't you know that I could call 12 legions of angels to put an end to this? Well, you wouldn't call that a man with no strength, would you? But by the time that this psalm begins to refer to Jesus after his crucifixion, after his physical death, and during those three days and nights when he's paying the price for mankind's sins, that's when he was a man without strength. You remember the last thing Jesus said was, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Why did he say that? He's indicating to us, this is the place where I go from having the power to call the 12 legions of angels or the power to do anything else I wanted to to avoid this to where it's all in God's hands now. It was the final act to completely surrender himself unto God's plan of redemption and the horrible things that he knew, he had to have known. He wouldn't have gone into this with his eyes closed. He would have to have known he was God himself. He had to know what was involved and what it would take. So that was the final step in his physical life. To commend his spirit into God's hands. God's going to have to do the work from there on. Verse 5, it says, free among the dead. Here again, this is kind of difficult. Apparently it means, or the closest thing that we can uh, translate it to mean, is that he was joined to those that were dead. Now again, when the Bible talks about, talks about death, we've got to ask ourselves, what death does it mean? Because there are certain times where the Bible talks about death that it means physical death. But that can't be the case here. It's talking about something at the end of physical death, if these things are talking about Jesus. It's showing that his spirit is still eternal. And folks, everybody's spirit is eternal. I think uh, this, the phrase that the Bible uses, eternal life, I think, I think that's a misnomer among a lot of people because they think it means existence. But you're made as a spirit being in the image of God, and that's true for every human being on the planet. Whether they're saved or whether they're unsaved, their spirits are going to live forever. The question is, where are they going to live forever? If you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior and his sacrifice as yours or as for you, then confessing him as your Lord and Savior ensures that eternity will be for you in heaven joined with God the Father. But the unsaved are just as eternal spirit beings as you and I are. So free among the dead like the, like the slain that lie in the grave whom thou rememberest no more. Notice this phrase, and they are cut off from thy hand. You remember in the Old Testament, on the Day of Atonement, it tells us that there were two sacrifices that had to be made to cover the sins of Israel. And you remember the routine, how that every year on the Day of Atonement, these two sacrifices would be made, and it would give Israel a pass. It would forgive Israel's sins for a one-year period, but it had to continually be done each year after another. One of the sacrifices we are familiar with because it was where the blood of the, the lamb or the goat that was used was splashed on the altar and that blood being presented to the altar covered the sins of the people or forgave the sins of the people for the short term. The Bible says where there is no shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But there was another sacrifice that not many people focus on very much. And that was what was called the scapegoat. 
Now, the scapegoat was just as pure as the other lamb that was offered as a sacrifice for his blood. In fact, they both had to be examined by the high priest and pronounced clean without spot or blemish, as the the Scripture says. And they would cast lots, which was the essential, uh, the net effect of rolling dice or something like that. And the scapegoat would be attended to by the high priest. The high priest would set his hands on the head of the scapegoat and pronounce all the sins of Israel. There was this long, 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 long list of sins that were individually identified while the high priest's hands were on the head of this goat. And the action of the high priest working in obedience to what God instructed them to do as representing the people of Israel, God accepted it as the transfer from the sins of Israel to this scapegoat. And this scapegoat was then carried by or led out of the city by a strong man, a strong warrior, somebody that was well capable and well respected. And the Bible says that they were to take this scapegoat and take it to a place that was cut off from the land of the living. Now, anything and everything Jesus did to fulfill the plan of redemption, to bring us into righteousness, all the types of the Old Testament, all the rituals of the Old Testament had to be fulfilled by what he did too. So Jesus becomes both sacrifices. Jesus becomes the lamb that was slain and his blood brings righteousness and remission of sins. But he also had to be the scapegoat. He had to go to the place that was cut off from the land of the living, which this phrase refers to. He had to pay the price. The scapegoat, when he was taken out into the wilderness, the judgment of God fell on him down there. Well, if Jesus fulfills that, then he has to be taken to the place that is cut off from the land of the living and bear the punishment for mankind's sins as the judgment of God comes on him too. See, folks, when Jesus recoils from the crucifixion, he's recoiling from the judgment of God passing upon the judgment of God for mankind passing upon him. He knows this is not going to be a walk in the park. He knows that God cannot cut any corners. He knows that for this to have a legal application, and again, I want to use the phrase, the legal side of righteousness. If there's no legal side of righteousness, then no matter how good we try to be, any and every failure on our part would keep us out of God's best. But instead, if if righteousness was enacted and obtained legally by Jesus paying the price, whatever that awful price was, I'm glad we don't know the full extent of it. But if he he paid every bit of that awful price, then that means when God declares that that our righteousness is of him, he can point back to Jesus in the face of the enemy, in the face of the devil, and say that Jesus paid for every little bit. See, we're not righteous because we feel righteous. We may never come to the place where we feel righteous. But we're righteous because it's been purchased legally. Every child of God is legally made righteous. Every child of God. So when the devil starts telling you how bad you are, remind him that you don't have anything to do with righteousness or the righteousness that you were made by the work of Jesus. He's the one that did the work. The devil wants you to think you can lose your righteousness or lose the effectiveness of your righteousness, and you can't. If it was based on anything that you and I did other than accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then we'd be of a creek because I'm sure we'd all mess it up some way or another to a great degree. But we can't mess up what we didn't have anything to do with. And the only thing that we have to do with concerning righteousness is the acceptance and receiving of it. Verse 6, thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, that's the place of the unrighteous dead, in darkness, in the deeps, thy thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Now the word wrath means boiling anger. 
We know that hell is an eternal fire. We know, as we were referring to the story of the certain rich man and a certain man named Lazarus, the rich man was wanting Abraham to get Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool his tongue, for he was tormented in the flame. So hell is a place, a place of fire, a fire that can't be quenched, a fire that never ends. Here Jesus is talking about, or this the scripture referring to Jesus, it says, Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and ha thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. It's talking about the anger of God. And folks, God is a God of justice. He's a God of judgment. Thank God he's not God, uh, the God that judges us because we're in Christ Jesus. But God hates sin. The Bible makes no bones about that. He hates sin. And one of the reasons that he hates sin so much is because sin is what kept his children bound. It's what kept his creation locked into bondage. And so when the price is being paid, God didn't hold up because he knew it was his son that was paying the price for mankind. Every bit of judgment upon sin that was right and appropriate and due came upon Jesus. Wave after wave after wave after wave. Verse 8, thou hast put, me, put away mine acquaintance far from me. This acquaintance is either talking about people or it's talking about the Holy Spirit. Which do you think it means? It's got to be the Holy Spirit. It's got to be. Jesus can't be lamenting as he's paying the price for mankind's sin. He can't be lamenting that he doesn't have his disciples around him anymore. But what does it mean if the Holy Ghost left him? Remember Jesus, the last thing he said, we talked about this a few minutes ago. The last thing Jesus said is, Father, into your hand I commend my spirit. Darkness covered the face of the earth. One of the things Jesus said just prior to that was, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the point where he becomes spiritually dead. That's the point where he was separated from God. And that's what spiritual death means. It means separation from God. Spiritual death is not the cessation of existence. As we said, people will live for, forever, eternally, in the lower part of the earth, which is then cast into the lake of fire. Why did God have to forsake Jesus? Because there had to be a price that was paid for sin. And God cannot look upon sin. Here again, thou hast put away mine acquaintance. The Holy Spirit has departed far from me. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them, meaning him, the Holy Spirit. This word abomination means something vile and disgusting. This was not a pretty thing that took place, folks. This is not something that we can romanticize and try to put flowers on and dress it up to be something that is not. Sin is ugly. Sin is filthy. Sin is unclean in every respect. And so if Jesus was made to be those things by being made sin for us, we have to realize the vile nature that Jesus, is, that Jesus signed up for that finally comes upon him. Thou hast made me an abomination unto them, meaning his acquaintance, he said, I am shut up and I cannot come forth. Again, it's an indication that he has no power of his own to get out of this place. Jesus was in the heart of the earth, the belly of the earth, the lowest pit of hell, and there was no mercy. There was no mercy he could cry out for. The price had to be paid. Mine eye mourneth by reason of affliction, Lord, I have called daily upon thee. Well, if he's calling daily upon the Lord, then it means he's there for more than one day. He was there for three, in fact. I called out daily upon thee. I have stretched out my hands unto thee. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Now, folks, one of the things about this that I can see the wisdom of God in, you remember there's a scripture in the New Testament Paul wrote to the church saying, if Satan knew that the crucifixion would bring the resurrection 
he never would have crucified Jesus. Well, was Satan ever in a place where he couldn't have read these scriptures or heard people speak these scriptures? We have the idea, wrong idea, a lot of times I think, that the devil knows more than he knows. A lot of people think the devil knows everything just like God does. But even in the scriptures that tell us about the work of our Messiah, they have to be cryptic to a certain measure or a certain degree. Because if Satan had known what God's plan was, he never would have carried it out. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? Well, that's exactly what happened, didn't it? But you see the cryptic nature of it. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave? It was. Or thy faithfulness in destruction? Yeah. Shall thy wonders be known in the dark? And thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? That phrase literally means among those who, have for, who are forgotten. Again, it's talking about the unrighteous dead. But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. In other words, he's saying, first thing in the morning for me, not like he's had sleep overnight but the first thing in the morning for me is to cry out unto the Lord now folks I want to ask you a question and I know we don't think about these things very often but I want you to consider something for a minute what do you think the people in hell are doing the Bible talks about being tormented the Bible talks about the eternal flame of hell and then at the end the final judgment the Bible says hell and death are cast into the lake of fire that's even worse than it is now. But part of the torment of hell has to be the hopelessness. I wonder if there are any people in hell that are crying out to God for mercy, that heard enough about God's mercy so that they, even, they might even know the words. Maybe they don't know what it means. Maybe they didn't do. Maybe they heard enough to be saved, but they never made the choice. I think one of the greatest areas or ways that mankind is going to be tormented, those that go to hell are going to be tormented, is to know that they didn't have to be there. I wonder if anybody else is crying out for God. I don't see how they wouldn't be. Can you? Lord, why castest thou off my soul? That's another way of saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus was forsaken for those three days and nights while he was paying the price for sin. Why hidest thou thy face from me? I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up. While I suffer thy terrors, I am distracted. While I suffer thy terrors. You remember when Moses went up into Mount Sinai? The Bible talks about the thickness of the thick black smoke and the lightnings and the thunders and all that kind of stuff where people on the ground looking up at the mountain said nobody can survive that. It was an awesome display of God's power just in the natural realm. I wonder what his terrors are like. Thank God we'll never have to know him. I am distracted. This word distracted means confused, perplexed, bewildered. Now, folks, I know that the things that we experience are nothing in comparison to this, so forgive me for making the comparison. But we need to keep something in mind, and that is there are places and there are times where natural and physical circumstances get so tough and become so extreme that people that start off strong in faith lose their ground. That's why it's so important for us to help one another in prayer. You can get to the place where your body hurts so bad you don't know what you're believing. No matter what you started off believing, that's the distraction and the bewilderment that Jesus is talking about, that Jesus refers to. I don't believe that Jesus' time in hell 
and his resurrection afterwards had anything to do with his faith. Because it's all now just the completion of God's plan. I do believe that it was his faith in God, his Father, that brought him to the cross that led to his physical death, the death of his body, and that put him in the place of the unrighteous dead, the lowest pit of, the, of hell. But once he submitted himself unto God, it's not a matter of what he believes. It's not a matter of what he confesses. It's a matter of God's will and plan and purpose coming into effect. The same thing's true where the rapture is concerned. You don't have to confess for the rapture for it to happen. You don't have to believe Jesus is coming back for him to come back. These are things that are in the hands of God, and he will fulfill his plan and purpose. I believe that's how Jesus could have been bewildered and confounded, as this says. Verse 16, thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. Here's the burning judgment of God again they came round about me daily like water they encompassed me about together lover and friend hast thou put far from me and mine acquaintance into darkness this is describing something specifically the fierce anger of God the fierce wrath of God you can't find any other point in time in anybody's individual life or in that which was spoken of to come like during the tribulation period. You can't find any time that these scriptures apply to anybody that we know of in any way whatsoever. Nobody suffers the fierce wrath of God where waves of his terror comes upon them wave after wave after wave. So who could this be talking about other than Jesus? I don't see any other possibility. When Jesus was talking to his disciples at the Last Supper, the thing that they were concerned about is when Jesus said that he was going away. They were so grieved by the thought, the reality as Jesus explained it to them, they were so grieved by the thought of him going away from them, they didn't think what he was facing. They had no spiritual insight into what he had to do so they're getting all freaked out and upset because Jesus is saying he's going away he did say I'll come back to you after a little while too but you can see because Jesus would have to have known these things were ahead of him he would have to have known that these were the important things that his crucifixion and his death were about He knows what he's entering into. So when Jesus appears to his disciples and says, peace be unto you, and breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Ghost, I'm pretty well convinced that it meant a lot more to him than it does to us when we read it. Jesus knew what he conquered to make my, mankind eligible for righteousness. Now turn with me over to Romans chapter 5, please. We'll try to close up with this. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. It says, for if, the word if is literally the word since. For since by one's man, one man's offense, talking about Adam, death spiritual death reigned by one much more they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one jesus christ folks i want you to understand and see for yourself that this righteousness remember where we started god made jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of god in him jesus being made sin was an ugly ugly thing but it was necessary. It was the only way that man could be redeemed. It was the only way that God could bring his children or his creation into being his children and his family. 
It was the only possible way. And just as truly and just as awfully, just as horrifically as Jesus was made to be sin, so completely were you and I made to be righteous. Now, the devil doesn't want you to know that. The devil doesn't want you to understand how thorough and how complete your righteousness is. He wants to keep you and me stuck in the feeling part. Whether or not we feel like we measure up to God. Whether we feel like we're worthy of righteousness. And none of those things matter. Because your feelings don't keep you from being righteous if you've been born again. And you really didn't deserve it except Jesus did it for you. But I think most people get stuck in that whirlpool. They never make advances. They just keep going around and around and around in the same circle. But that's not the way God wants it to be. So here, it's talking about that righteousness, that absolute righteousness, that complete righteousness that was purchased by the blood of Jesus and the awful things that he, did, that he endured before his resurrection, between his crucifixion and his resurrection. That righteousness is the foundation for victory. That righteousness is the foundation for your victory in every respect. For since by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Notice it doesn't say shall be born again by Jesus Christ. It says we shall reign by Jesus Christ. If we receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, that is salvation. But that salvation doesn't just stop when you make Jesus your Lord and Savior. That righteousness that comes as a result of the wonderful things that Jesus was willing to endure. Wonderful in the sense of horrific. The marveling things. I, I, I firmly believe when we get to heaven, we're going to see what Jesus did and we're going to marvel. Verse 21. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that Jesus was raised from the dead by the spirit of holiness. By the spirit of holiness. Now, folks, let me, let me tie this up real quick. And this is the controversial part. I don't see a lot of controversy in some of the things, most of the things that we've talked about and read in scriptures so far, thus far, thus far. But here's the controversial part. Here's the part people don't like to think about. If the Bible tells us, and we read in Revelation 1, 5, that Jesus was the first begotten from the dead. He was not the firstborn from physical death. There were several people in Jesus' ministry that were raised from physical death, Lazarus being the, the primary one that we know about and remember. But there were times in the Old Testament where people were raised again from, from physical death. So Jesus could not be the firstborn or first begotten from physical death. Well, there's only two deaths, either physical death or spiritual death. Since we know he couldn't have been the, one, the first one to be born again from spiritual death, uh, from physical death. That means he has to be the first born from spiritual death. Well, that means he had to be spiritually dead then. And that's tough for people to take. But folks, if Jesus was not spiritually dead, he could not have paid the price for you and I. He could not have been the substitute to keep you and I from having to suffer spiritual death ourselves. See the Bible says the wages of sin is death. It's not talking about physical death. It's saying the punishment or the payment. The retribution. For sin. Is spiritual death. If Jesus didn't die spiritually then you still have to. That's why he had to be our substitute. That's why he had to take it all upon himself to free us from it. So if Jesus was spiritually dead, and remember again, the definition of spiritual death is not cessation of existence, but it's separation from God. 
So for those three days and nights, Jesus was separated from God in every respect as he paid the price for sin and death, spiritual death. And the Bible pulls no punches when it talks about the, the fierce wrath of God come upon, coming upon him wave after wave after wave after wave after wave. God literally made him to be sin for us. Jesus died spiritually. Had to. So what does that mean? Well, again, referring back to Romans chapter 4 and verse 25, he was raised again for our justification, or literally he was raised again when we were justified. You have the same new birth experience that Jesus has. That means you're just as much the child of God as he is. That means God's righteousness was imputed to him first. It was made unto him first. But in equal measure, it's been made unto you and me too. Now, folks, that's how seriously God takes this stuff. I think it deserves at least consideration on our part, don't you? And that, in and of itself, is the only way that righteousness could be the foundation for victory in every other respect of our lives. Where the Bible talks about we're more than conquerors. Why are we more than conquerors? Because we've been made righteousness. The righteousness of God because of what Jesus did. When the Bible says God's for us, so who can be against us? The foundation of that is the righteousness. That work, inner work of the Holy Spirit that made us new creatures in Christ Jesus. New species of being. God, men, and women. That's why the subject of faith is so important. Because we have the same life. We have the same new birth. We have the same righteousness that raised Jesus from the dead. That in a moment of time swept in upon Jesus and changed him, recreated him, if you will, and seated him at the right hand of God the Father. Now folks there are a lot of things about this I still have questions about. There's a lot of this that I don't understand. Don't claim to understand. But I'm willing to stick with what I know. And the things that we've seen are things that we can and should know. I've heard people in making criticisms. About the teaching that Jesus died spiritually. I've heard them say things like, if those people really loved God, they wouldn't say those things that they say. Well, recognizing these things makes me love him more, not less. Doesn't it you? Recognizing the awful things that Jesus suffered for you and me makes me appreciate him even more. Doesn't it you? But besides that, what are we going to do with the scripture that identifies specifically that Jesus was the first begotten from the dead? I know a lot of people just say that's first begotten from physical death, but that's impossible. There's no way that could be it. We've got too much scripture to, to refute that. So if it's not physical death, what is it? It's got to be spiritual death. God did not lay on Jesus with a wink and a nod something that he called the price for, for sin and death. Jesus paid every moment of it. Wave after wave of God's fierce, fierce wrath. So that you and I could live. See when I focus on those things. And when I recognize those things. When I meditate on them and speak them out. To myself. And even teach them here in church. It makes me appreciate what he's done. And because of what he's done, I think we owe him a life. 
I think we owe him a good life, a life well lived. Don't you? I know a lot of people just look at Jesus as fire insurance. Just trying to avoid hell. And if that's the only reason somebody will come into the family of God, by all means come in. But because we know more of what Jesus paid for and how he did it, I think we owe him a life well lived. We owe him our obedience. We owe him our love. And we owe him our faith. Amen. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your great plan of redemption. Only you could have come up with this, Father, a total and a complete redemption. A redemption that brought us into your family. A redemption that made us righteous and victorious through that righteousness. Lord Jesus, we love you so much for being willing to pay the price. The price that we would have had to pay for ourselves. Holy Spirit, continue to open our eyes to the truth of these things that we might see and know who we are in Christ and the exceeding greatness of his power that works in us because we've been made righteous by his blood. We ask you these things in the precious and holy name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Well, folks, I hope you're quiet because you're thinking about things, not because I've depressed you. We serve a good God. Amen. Say it with me. The Lord is good, and his mercy endures forever. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.